On October the 14th, 1947, over California's Mojave Desert, U.S. Army Air Force Captain Charles E. Chuck Yeager became the first person to fly faster than the speed of sound, piloting the Bell X-1 experimental rocket plane. It was a stunning achievement, paving the way for routine supersonic flight and earning Yeager the prestigious Collier Trophy and a place in the history books. Yet strange as it may seem, Yeager may actually have been beaten to the punch a full two years earlier by a German jet pilot during during World War II. And stranger still, it happened completely by accident. In the 1930s and 40s, as aircraft began flying ever faster and higher, pilots began encountering a disturbing phenomenon. At speeds above 600 kilometers per hour, their controls would freeze up and the nose of their aircraft would suddenly pitch down, sending them into a lethal, unrecoverable dive. This problem, known as compressibility, was particularly acute in high-performance fighters like the Lockheed P-38 Lightning, which during flight trials in 1941 killed test pilot Ralph Verdon when the tail ripped off in a high-speed dive. As this phenomenon occurred near the speed of sound, or Mach 1, pilots began to speak of a sound barrier, an invisible upper limit to manned flight. Engineers, however, were not so sure. While the P-38's compressibility issues were solved by installing special dive recovery flaps, this was only a temporary solution. If aircraft were to fly safely above 600 km per hour, the aerodynamics of flight at transonic and sonic speeds had to be understood. It was soon discovered that the strange phenomenon encountered by pilots was caused by the formation of shock waves on the aircraft. Shock waves form at the speed of sound, but as airflow varies widely over the surface of an aircraft, they will form in certain areas before others. When they form on the wings, this creates a change in pressure distribution that causes a sudden pitching down of the nose, what pilots call mock tuck. And when shock waves form on the hinges of elevators and other control surfaces, it can cause them to lock up and become unresponsive, making the resulting dive unrecoverable. While all these problems were theoretically solvable, there was another major hurdle to achieving supersonic flight. Shockwaves also form on propeller blades, making them less and less effective the faster they turned. This meant that no matter how powerful an engine was installed, no propeller-driven aircraft could exceed the speed of sound. However, the Second World War saw the introduction of two brand new propulsion technologies, the rocket engine and the jet engine, and in these lay the key to practical high-speed flight. On April the 9th, 1945, barely a month before the end of the war in Europe, Cadet Sergeant Hans Guido Muttke took off from Lagerschfeld in Germany flying a Messerschmitt Me-262. The Me-62 was the world's first operational jet fighter, entering service with the German Luftwaffe in April of 1944. Powered by two Junker Jumos 004 turbojet engines, the aircraft was capable of a then unheard of speed of 900 km per hour and had superb handling, which German ace Adolf Gallen described as like a Angels pushing. Far outclassing anything the Allies could field, it could have been a war-winning weapon were it not for one man, Adolf Hitler. Obsessed with remaining on the offensive even as enemy forces closed in on all sides, Hitler insisted that the Me-262 be developed into a high-speed bomber, a role for which it was ill-suited. By the time he changed his mind and authorized full-scale production of the jet fighter, the war was already lost and the bombing of German factories combined with chronic shortages of spare parts and jet fuel kept most Me-262 Twos grounded and prevented them from having a major impact on the war. Nonetheless, in its single year of operational use, the Me-262 racked up a total of 542 confirmed kills, with 28 jet pilots attaining ace status. Going back to that April morning in 1945, Cadet Sergeant Muttke was on his third training flight in the Me-262, along with several other cadets and an instructor, Lieutenant Colonel Heinz Baer. Muttke had just reached an altitude of 12,000 meters when the flight was attacked by a group of American P-51 Mustangs. Racing to his comrades' aid, Muttke opened the throttle and pushed his aircraft into a 40-degree dive. As Muttke accelerated through 11,000 meters, he began to experience the telltale signs of compressibility, his aircraft buffeting and swinging side to side, and his controls growing increasingly stiffer. His airspeed indicator, which only went up to 870 kilometers per hour, jumped off the scale. When Muttke tried to pull out of the dive, the controls would not respond. The aircraft became uncontrollable, shaking violently and threatening to break apart as it hurtled towards the ground. Then something strange happened. The buffeting suddenly stopped. The cockpit went eerily quiet, and Muttke discovered he had full control of the aircraft. Yet he was still accelerating with his airspeed indicator needle stuck against the stop peg. 
But Mikey had little time to ponder this strange phenomenon, as a few seconds later, both his engines flamed out. The aircraft decelerated and the buffeting returned, not dissipating until Mutke had dropped below the aircraft's maximum rated speed of 870 kilometers per hour. Mutke immediately returned to base and upon landing was shocked to discover the condition of his aircraft. Dozens of rivets had been ripped out of the airframe and his wings were bent and twisted. Due to this damage, Mutke did not report the dive to his superiors as exceeding 900 kilometers per hour was strictly forbidden. But Mucky didn't quite know what to make of the strange phenomena he'd encountered during the flight, so he put it out of his mind. It was not until three years later when Mucky learned of the pioneering flights of Chuck Yeager that he came to a startling realization, that he had broken the sound barrier. Or at least, the facts certainly seem to fit. When an aircraft exceeds the speed of sound, the multiple shock waves forming all over the airframe coalesce into a single shock cone, leading to smoother airflow. The sudden quiet Mucky experience is also consistent with supersonic flight, as at such speeds an aircraft effect effectively outruns the sound from its own engines. The ME-262's engines, however, were not designed to ingest air at supersonic speeds, and breaking the sound barrier would have caused them to flame out just as Mutke had experienced. Further, as the aircraft decelerated through the transonic regime, the single shock cone would have broken up into multiple shock waves, causing the violent buffeting to return. But the most compelling piece of evidence was the fact that unlike most aircraft, the ME-262 had an all-moving horizontal stabilizer, which instead of having separate hinged elevators rotated as a single unit. This feature was later added to the Bell X-1 supersonic rocket plane to get around the problem of shock waves forming on the elevator hinges and freezing up the controls. The ME-262's design would thus have made it uniquely capable of maintaining pitch controls at transonic and supersonic speeds. All that said, many are highly skeptical of Mutke's claims. When designing the ME-262, engineer Willie Messerschmitt conducted a series of wind tunnel tests to determine the aircraft's maximum speed. He could concluded that the 262 could not exceed Mach 0.86 without experiencing pitch-down forces so powerful no pilot could recover from the resulting dive. Post-war test flights of captured 262s conducted by the British Royal Aircraft Establishment confirmed this, with RAE engineers pinning the aircraft's maximum speed at Mach 0.84. Engineers have further argued that the 262's engines were too underpowered and its wings and its airframe insufficiently aerodynamic to allow for supersonic flight, and the phenomenon Mutke encountered. Further, the phenomenon Mutke encountered, like his airspeed indicator jumping off the scale, can occur at lower speeds in certain circumstances. However, several early jets not designed for supersonic flight, such as the North American F-86 Sabre and Hawker Hunter, still managed to break the sound barrier in a dive, the combination of engine thrust and gravitational acceleration being just enough to overcome the drag of the airframe. This fact has prompted a re-evaluation of Hans Mutke's claims. For example, in 1999, Professor Otto Wagner of Munich's Technical University carried out a series of computer simulations and determined that the ME-262 could theoretically reach Mach 1.02 in a dive and remain controllable. However, Wagner admitted that the aerodynamic data available in the ME-262 was unreliable and that obtaining Willie Messerschmitt's original wind tunnel data from 1941 would allow for more definitive analysis. And unfortunately, theoretical models are about the only available way of testing Mutke's claims. No original ME-262s remain flying and the few flying replicas in existence use completely different modern engines. Plus, sending an aircraft into a supersonic dive is far too dangerous just to test an 80-year-old anecdote. And in any case, whether or not Hans Guido Mutke actually broke the sound barrier is irrelevant. Official aviation records are administered by the Federal Aeronautic International, a governing body based in Switzerland, and every record must be confirmed using onboard FAI recording equipment. Thus, due to the unmonitored wartime nature of his 1945 flight, Mutke was ineligible to claim an official record, while the October 14, 1947 flight of the X-1, which carried FAI recording equipment, was. Thus, the title of first pilot to break the sound barrier still belongs to Chuck Yeager. How about some bonus facts? Another pilot often claimed to have broken the sound barrier before Chuck Yeager is a test pilot by the name of George Welsh, perhaps best known as one of the few American fighter pilots to make it into the air and engage the Japanese during the attack on Pearl Harbor. In his 1998 book, Aces Wild, The Race for Mach 1, fellow test pilot Al Blackburn claimed that Welsh broke the sound barrier in a dive two weeks before Yeager while test flying the North American XP-86, the prototype of the famous F-86 Sabre. According to 
to Blackburn, Welch was reprimanded for this act as official Air Force orders at the time forbade pilots of other aircraft from breaking the sound barrier before the X-1. This was allegedly because the Air Force had poured vast resources into the X-1 project and did not want a regular and less expensive aircraft beating them to the punch. But either way, the historical record does not support the claim that Welch broke the sound barrier. While Welch did begin test flying the XP-86 in late September of 1947, he immediately ran into problems extending the aircraft's landing gear. It was thus decided to carry out subsequent test flights with the wheels extended, making it impossible for it to fly supersonically. The XP-86 would not fly with its wheels retracted until after the X-1's record-breaking flight on October the 14th. Furthermore, many engineers and pilots at the time doubted that the XP-86 J-35 jet engine had enough power to push the aircraft past Mach 1, even in a dive and with the wheels retracted. There is evidence, however, that Welsh broke the sound barrier on October 19th, barely a month after Jaeger and the X-1. However, this claim is based on data from ground tracking equipment and not sensors mounted on board the aircraft itself. According to the Air Force records, the XP-86 did not officially fly faster than sound until May 21st, 1948, a full seven months later. So once again, Chuck Yeager's claim to the title remains indisputable. That said, Yeager's claim to being the first to break the sound barrier was also challenged by the U.S. Navy, though this time on the basis of a technicality. At the time, FAI rules stated that to qualify for an official record, an aircraft had to take off and land under its own power. According to the Navy, this disqualified the X-1, which was air launched from a B-29 mothership. It also meant that the first supersonic aircraft was conveniently the Navy's own jet-powered Douglas D-558-1. On Sky Streak. As you might imagine, the Air Force did not take kindly to this challenge, and on January the 5th, 1949, Chuck Yeager performed the first and only ground takeoff in the X-1. The acceleration was so powerful it ripped off the aircraft's flaps, but Yeager managed to maintain control and pull the X-1 into a near vertical climb. 90 seconds later, Yeager broke the sound barrier at an altitude of 7,000 meters, not only proving the Navy wrong, but setting a long-standing time-to-climb record in the process.